Hello, welcome to the Creative Sobriety Podcast. This is episode 97, and my name is Charlie. And today we have a guest, his name is Aaron, and he's going to talk about his brother's experience with Kratom and sadly his passing. But before we talk to Aaron, I just want to let folks know this is going to be our last Wednesday episode. We started a special series in July, and we've been dropping new shows with different experts and family members and others to give a different perspective on what's going on in Kratom. Appreciate everybody listening, and I'm, I'm really honored to have Aaron to be the capstone for this series. Uh, welcome, Aaron. Please introduce yourself, you know, just a basic background of who you are. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, my name's Aaron. I live in Austin, Texas. I'm a builder here. I grew up in Texas, moved around a bit, lived in Washington State for a little bit, lived in Utah for a little while. Yeah, I do alternative building. I'm actually do like eco-friendly building and some of our newest projects are hemp related. The wall systems are actually made out of hemp. Got that going on and that's uh, something I have in common with my brother, Matt. He was into the environment and doing eco-friendly stuff. Another thing I have in common with Matt is that I've also struggled with addiction throughout my life, whether it was pot or other drugs or alcohol. Yeah, even though I haven't tried Kratom, I can relate to that struggle. Just want to be here to help. That's interesting around the hemp products for the building. Yeah, that's something they I think they've done in Europe for maybe decades. But yeah, they use the waste product of hemp. It's basically these little chunks, little mulch bits of hemp that they mix with lime. That is the binder. Yeah, you can create walls with it. And it's good insulation. You can plaster it. It looks really beautiful when it's done. And one last thing, when you talk about your personal struggles with substances, is it an ongoing thing or is it something like that kind of like in your past that you've overcome? No, it's it's an ongoing thing. Yeah, I'm still still working on weeding out the alcohol. It's an interesting struggle of when you've lived so long, depending on things to kind of create not an equilibrium, I guess, but I don't know. Yeah, when you fall back on on substances, it's interesting to picture a life without something. So yeah, trying to figure out a harm reduction strategy. Yeah, without ending up on a substance that has its own set of risks and causes harm itself. I I think we were both born in the 70s and you might be hitting your 50s pretty soon. So yeah, once you lived as long as us, there's some water under the bridge. Yeah, and alcohol's that's a pretty rough one on the body. And so I can see people's struggles of wanting to find something that is a healthier alternative. I can see the the uh, appeal of a substance, a drug, a product, you know, like Kratom. So I don't blame anybody for forever really reaching for it, you know? It's appealing. Well, t- tell us about Matt. Just a super thoughtful, sensitive kid. Well, he was a man. <laughs> and he was 15 years younger, and so I didn't really grow up with him. So I moved closer to him in my late 20s. Yeah, just to kind of get to know my brother some more and and yeah, be close to him. He got a degree in environmental science, yeah, an environmental engineering degree. He did a lot of volunteer work. He worked for a bicycle collective where he taught people how to work on bikes and you know, they built bikes and handed them out to the community. I think he volunteered at you know, animal shelters. He worked with kids in Moab, kind of taking them on rafting trips and he was a he was a deep thinker and feeler and yeah, just a really good person all around really. Yeah. I mean, there's so much to say. <laughs> yeah, well, do you have a favorite memory of him? Oh, when I lived in Utah, or even when I didn't live in Utah, we'd, we'd snowboard quite a bit together. Yeah, I think those trips when it was just me and him on a chairlift or sitting out in the backcountry, just kind of in the silence of the mountains and the snow, didn't even have to be talking. Like, just being together was, was kind of my memories of him. Yeah. It's nice to have those to be able to look back fondly. Well, I know he started using Kratom. Do you know why he was drawn to Kratom? I don't know why originally he was. I heard he, from some of his friends, that they had tried it sometime during college. And I don't know how much he dabbled in it through those years. But he he had always been kind of an anxious kid. I think he always suffered from anxiety, which I didn't necessarily see because I didn't grow up with him for too many years, but from according to my parents and other family that was around him more. The last few years he was using it, I'm pretty sure he'd turn to it to deal with anxiety, but also 
to stay away from alcohol. He did end up having an alcohol issue in his mid twenties, had gotten sober. And so I think Kratom was what he had turned to um, as a natural, supposedly natural, safe alternative to uh, drinking or prescription meds. Did you have any signs that there was issues with the Kratom use or did your parents report any problems? You know, I hadn't even heard about Kratom until he was already in the hospital and pretty much dead. He was in an induced coma uh, because he was an organ donor. Yeah, I think he had some erratic behavior. He was really isolating a lot. And yeah, they didn't know really what was going on. Like, you know, he wasn't drinking. And then I think they discovered the Kratom. They started looking into it and realizing, oh, there, there's some negative side effects that you're having. And I think he, by that time, he was already so maybe deep into his dependence or addiction that he wasn't hearing it. You know, there was just so much stuff online pushing this stuff as a safe, you know, plant medicine. So, yeah, not, I don't know the exact timeline of when they realized something was really going on. Before we talk about his death, so he was an uh, organ donor. Was his organs were able to help other people after his death? Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how many people, but I know I think some part of his heart helped some older gentlemen that had heart issues. And I believe there was a little girl that was five or six that I think it was her kidneys. I think she was born without kidneys or either way. Yes. His kidneys helped her and our family got a letter from them and that was pretty moving. Yeah. Well, what happened that he ended up in the hospital? So I guess back to your other question, I guess there were signs of the Kratom, the side effects he started having was he was starting to have seizures, which I had heard about through my mom, but I don't think they had connected it to the Kratom yet. So yeah, I don't know how many seizures, how often, because Matt actually kind of went radio silent on everybody. Um, yeah. He just stopped communicating with people. So yeah, finally, I guess he you know, had one last seizure and, and uh, died. He was actually that night, my parents had, they had a big talk about him needing to quit and sounded like he finally came, you know, was hearing them and said, okay, right. going to quit. And sadly, like many people that they probably do really, truly mean to quit. I think they have one last, you know, whatever. Many times before I quit, I, I would have one last hurrah and I would do more than I would normally do, you know, cause I was going to stop the next day. And, and for some people, depending on their genetics that could be too much that might be the case with your brother how old was he and did he have any like pre-existing conditions uh he was 30 and no no pre pre-existing conditions and the seizures he had started going to a doctor to figure it out and they couldn't find it it was an epilepsy they couldn't find you know any normal reason why he would be having seizures so that makes me think they either didn't know he was using kratom or they just didn't know what kratom was and during this period, was he able to stay off and refrain from drinking? As far as I know, yeah. He'd gotten sober and he was actually working for a treatment facility. I think it's like an in-house treatment facility for teenage kids. I think maybe it's just boys, um, which was in his town in Utah. He was taking them out snowboarding and mountain biking and stuff. So according to his his old boss, that you know, I think he was sober throughout that. Then the pandemic hit, and I think that kind of through his anxiety, through the roof, and especially because my mom is so ill and susceptible to, to COVID. So he ended up quit that job at the treatment facility and ended up just staying at home with my parents. And I think that just, you know, downward spiral uh, with the anxiety and the Kratom use. Yeah, we've interviewed a lot of quitters, Kratom quitters, and the pandemic is definitely a period of isolation. And a lot of people experienced a spike in their addictions during that period. Um, oh, yeah. Did he have an autopsy after his death? He did. Yep. Yeah, they ruled it uh, a toxic level of uh, metragenine that was the, the cause of death. He was on a prescribed anti-anxiety med as well. I believe it was called sertraline. That showed the, the prescribed amount was in his system, so he wasn't abusing that. And from what I've read and heard, that's just a bad mix. So... He didn't know. His doctors didn't know. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not a toxicologist, but my understanding is certain prescriptions like that inhibit your ability to process the kratom. 
and then it, it's like a double whammy, you know? So it's a dangerous interaction that right. maybe if he wasn't on that med, he might have survived. That just me making some educated guesses. But it's obviously that the Kratom was the cause or had a great influence on his death. Did they do any other toxicology reports to look at other substances? I don't remember what all was tested. No, I mean, it was just that one tox report that I saw that that and his death certificate shows it was, they ruled it Kratom was the, the cause of death. And I'm sorry for these questions. You know, you and I have talked about this before. A big part of your experience after his death is the pro Kratom world discounting your brother's death and people like your family and like it's some kind of fake thing, like the fake moon landing or something, you know, and and, yeah. and always do all those things to, to try to say that it wasn't the Kratom, you know, which there is complexities determining the cause of death when people die, you know, but it, I know that makes the experience more painful for you. And I apologize for the set of questions. No, oh, it's okay. It's It needs to be talked about. And and yeah, it is a disturbing thing that people just don't have the inability or they don't have, they don't have the ability to understand that two things can happen at once. Something could be helpful for one and terrible for another. You know, even with opiates, other drugs, some person could do it and not get addicted. You take your opiates that your doctor prescribed after your surgery and you could be fine. Some, the next person will get addicted. And yeah, the creative industry, it, it reminds me of the opiate industry's tactics, the tobacco industry's tactics, selling their product as this cure-all that's totally safe. And if ever there's a problem, it's either the, the user's fault or something else. And it's just ridiculous that they just can't be transparent, mature, professional. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, not, you're not going to be able to sell your Kratom. You know, you just let people make a, a an informed decision, you know? Yeah. Death from Kratom is relatively rare, but that doesn't that that rarity doesn't give you any solace, does it? No, not at all. Yeah. Any immediate responses from the healthcare providers or the local authorities to the death? How did they look at it? So when I went to the hospital, um, one of the nurses caring for Matt definitely had heard of Kratom and had seen people in the hospital for the same issues. When I went and got a copy of his toxicology report, I spoke to one of the doctors that did the exam, did his um, autopsy, and she was very aware of Kratom and its harmful effects. Do you know what the status of Kratom is in Utah? Like what the regulation system is? I believe maybe you just have to be 21 to buy it. I, I'm not totally sure, but it, I think it's pretty minimal. Do you have stores when you drive down the cities and the cities are there vape shops and Things like that, is it sold at gas stations? In in Austin, where I'm at, definitely. Like As soon as I heard about it after Matthew died, I'm noticing it everywhere. There's a grocery store I go to weekly that there's a vape shop right next door with a big old Kratom neon sign. And yeah, it's pretty disturbing. <laughs> Do you have any idea if your brother was like taking powder or if he was taking capsules? Was he using any kind of extract product? As far as I know, I think it was just powder where you're just mixing it, making a quote unquote tea. The stories I've heard from family and his friends that knew about his use. Anything else reflecting back at his death, about the circumstances you think are is notable that we should talk about? Yeah, I do think that, you know, the online presence, the advocacy, the pro Kratom information that's out there, I think really has done a lot of harm. Yeah, I think it's misleading too many people to, to think that they're getting into this safe alternative. I mean, people truly trying to do something right by themselves by staying away from alcohol or other drugs or just self-medicate, which most humans do in some form or fashion. And so to not allow people to make a, an informed decision, you know, you're just putting people at risk. There's the marketing, which... I think they capitalize too much on the, the harm reduction narrative and oversell that. And so it borderline on predatory to vulnerable populations, both in the marketing and then in the advocacy about Kratom, there's this whole like just denial of any negatives. I mean, we can't even, I mean, the whole purpose of this podcast is to create a space to say, 
Yes, Kratom can be addictive for some people. It can be a very addictive substance. It can be hard to quit. It can really be disruptive on people's life. But, you know, this podcast is born out of that disinformation, like that, you know, if anybody says that Kratom is addictive, you know, you just get hit with all these, like, it's just like coffee, et cetera. You know, it's a plant. It's all natural. You're on the side of big pharma. You know, you do have some dedicated spaces like Reddit, which people talk about their bad experiences, but it's kind of unmoderated and people do these first person accounts. And sometimes you get somebody that might have a major mental illness and Kratom and it, you know, and you can't tell like what, you know, is it the guy's mental illness or the Kratom? So it's just really hard to figure out like what the truth is. About, and, and, and it's the fact is it's nuanced. It's not black and white. There are some people that have found comfort and pain relief, a relief from an addiction. And there's other people that get stuck in it and have bad outcomes, including death. Absolutely. It, it was your podcast that when I was doing more research after Matthew's death, and I believe it was your podcast that I, you know, really started learning the other side of, of Kratom, you know, the, the harmful effects. I, I heard the, I think the first interview I heard of y'all's was with Ed Erickson, the uh, journalist whose nephew died. And so reading his stuff and, you know, his in-depth reporting, really, really good informative stuff. Um, and if more people would just look at both sides, you know, it's, a, it's such a weird thing that I don't doubt that it helps some people. I, if somebody tells me it's helping them, I ha have to believe them. Like, that's how they feel about it. That's how their experience. Like, who am I to say that is not helping them? Especially if I don't know them. <laughs> if I have no personal experience with this person to see if it's really helping them, then I just have to take their word. Just like they should believe people when they say it has harmed them. You know, it's how are you going to tell somebody that, no, it didn't. And it's just very disturbing, especially when it's lobbyists and advocates and people who are making money from it that are saying these things. But when you have influence, you have a platform, you have money behind you that, yeah, it's pretty sad that they would blame an individual or, you know, it's just, just gross. Yeah. Ed's reporting was, I think, the first journalistic efforts that looked at the dark side of Kratom and especially a look at the industry. And then since the podcast started, I, I think the Tampa Bay Deadly Dose series was a good follow up and more in depth. I know that there's a couple documentaries in the works, you know, so slowly we're moving the needle. The large industry, the industry, it's a billion dollar industry. And like other industries before them, I think, like you said, they're sort of replicating many of those playbooks to keep Kratom in the marketplace with as little restrictions as possible. Yeah, they're allowing consumers to be their guinea pigs. It's just a just a nasty business in my point of view. If if you're really selling something that's so safe and good for people, like you should be willing to prove it before you sell it to. <laughs> you know, it's a yeah. You can't say it's safe and then somebody have a hard time with it and then blame them because they had a hard time with it. Have you started to get involved in advocacy efforts after your brother's passing? I'm not super involved. I mean, I'm part of a Facebook group, the Kratom Danger Awareness, where interacting with people on there, trying to be supportive, writing into legislators and, and senators and things like that. Locally, I so I started going to a grief support group for people have lost loved ones to overdose. The majority of the people in there, their loved ones have died due to fentanyl. So I've been involved with some of that. So it's not specifically Kratom, but I feel like still helping, you know, we're all kind of in the same boat or a very similar boat of the stigma around addiction and mental health. Yeah, that stigma is powerful. I mean, it, if your brother had died in an auto accident, it would have a lot less negative baggage associated with it. You know, I mean, it'd still be this major grief experience, but it wouldn't have this other troubling stuff about, you know, stereotypes and negative conceptions of people that have addiction. Yeah. It keeps people in addiction. I think in a lot of ways, because you don't want to reach out and get help or talk about it because everybody looks down on, they think you have some character flaw or there, you know, there's something wrong with you that when in reality, there's so many people <laughs> dealing with this. Um, yeah. Or experiencing it. I imagine your brother dealt with it working in the field, you know, he probably was like, oh, I'm, I'm addicted to this over-counter thing. 
and the drug addicts don't count it as a real drug. <laughs> They'll be like, oh, why don't you try fentanyl and get back to me about your, your, your addiction? And then there's a whole industry and advocacy community that's it's safe and it's actually the cure for addiction. You know, the, the folks with kratom addiction even are even this other most secret hidden kind of thing. Yeah, I could imagine that it's such a weird place to be to... <laughs> I mean, I could kind of see it maybe being similar to your doctor prescribes you something that's supposed to be safe and whatnot, and you're believing this positive, you know, these experts, you know, just like the Kratom experts are supposedly telling everybody that this is supposedly super safe. And yeah, so then when something goes wrong, it's like, whoa, what's wrong with me? Like, it's what? (laughs) Yeah. I heard heard that with opiates too, you know, it's like, I just did what my doctor told me and now I'm... (laughs) Addictive. Yeah. I mean, one parallel I've seen is like Adderall is in that space a little bit. Some people, it really saves their lives and transforms their ability to live on a daily basis. And many of those folks sometimes had a previous addiction, but then other people get prescribed Adderall and they have a bad experience and they abuse it and it turns into an addiction itself. And now downstream, there's all these regulatory issues where Adderall um, is more restricted in the prescripting. And some people who legitimately need Adderall, it's hard to get your script filled nowadays. Regulating this stuff is really complicated and ensuring access to it when it does help versus trying to prevent it getting into the hands of the wrong people. It's it's not an easy equation you know, for something that has two sides to it. Right. Especially now, I mean, with the market so flooded, I mean, you're buying stuff at 7-Eleven, you know, it's it's everywhere, all these different variations of it, drinks, tincture, you know, just all kinds of stuff. So how, how do you, you've already opened Pandora's box, like how do you, yeah. how do you close that down? <laughs> yeah, Kratom's on the other end of the spectrum than, than something like Adderall, you know, it's just, it's kind of a wild west, except in the states where it's banned. What do you believe needs to be changed in terms of awareness, regulation uh, for this issue that we've been discussing? Man, that is a tough one. Knowledge is just, that's the first thing that pops into my head to be, yeah, to have more experts and money <laughs> yeah. to, co- to combat. Because it, it's just, it's hard to fight a lobbying group. They've already been out there for years, putting out their information in front of legislators and lawmakers and have gotten their scientists and doctors on board. So it's kind of, it's hard to fight that. Yeah. How do you, how do you get the money to get all the information out there uh, to the right people? Definitely a David and Goliath kind of situation where the Kratom industry is the Goliath with the resources and the Kratom folks, you know, who have been harmed by it, who are advocating for a better system, they just have a lot less access to political muscle, you know? Yep. The information warfare that's around this is nuts. It's dangerous. It's so, you know, it really is about money. It's it's about not wanting to be accountable and responsible. And to me, it feels like just the ability to make money any way they choose, you know? <laughs> yeah, there is a very strong libertarian kind of streak through all the the advocacy. I mean, and in your brother's case, like a simple regulation that would screen people that are taking certain prescriptions and consuming this product could save lives. I'm not sure how to administer that. You know, you have it behind the counter and you talk to a pharmacist and, but then in that case, it would be up to your brother or a consumer to disclose that he's consuming Kratom. But, you know, if it's the same pharmacist that's giving his other drugs, if he buys his Kratom at the the pharmacy and the pharmacy tech says, oh, you're on this other prescribed drug and there's a known interaction that would restrict the sale to somebody like your brother, you know, that's the opposite of the freedom that people want to be able to access this plant, you know, in pure form. But the American marketplace it's not even really plants anymore. And many of the products that people are buying, you know, that's right. one of the um, frustrating things about the arguments about it is they want it to be compared to a simple leaf. The simple leaf isn't what's being sold in America on every corner, you know. Right. Yeah, um, it reminds me, it makes me think it, it's so similar in my mind to the coca plant. Indigenous folks that have used it for however long pull these leaves off trees, chew them as they're doing their laborious work, could not chew enough leaves 
to kill yourself. <laughs> like, I don't think it's possible, you know, and it's diff. Then, you know, some Westerner goes to these regions and like, Oh, look what that does. Ooh. If we could extract that and concentrate it, imagine how, how much money that can make us, you know, and nobody here is chewing on leaves from a, tr- a fresh tree <laughs> or brewing a tea from a, having a dried leaf oxidating. I mean, the same happens with marijuana that it, if it's in the sun, it's oxidating. It's not kept in a cool, dry place with no light. Like it changes the chemistry of it and how your body metabolizes it. And the same with Kratom. Yeah. Especially the super concentrated shots and whatnot. It's, it's a whole different beast. It's, you know, it's in my brain, it's like, okay, now you're doing cocaine, you know, (laughs) you're, not doing like okay, but you know, you're doing this concentrated version of what the indigenous people in Thailand or Southeast Asia did, just a whole different level. Yeah. An everyday American consumer that picks up one of these products doesn't know any of that background, you know. And I was guilty of not Googling Kratom when I first consumed it. And so I assume that there's plenty of people that when they see it at the 7 Eleven, just think it's inherently safe because why would the government allow a product be on the shelf? So, well, in terms of other families out there, do you have anything you want to say to somebody that's had a similar experience to yours or has a family member that's currently struggling with the Kratom addiction? Yeah, I think don't let the stigma keep you silent. Like to be able to find support, whether it's friends, treatment facility, you know, just keeping the lines of communication open with each other and getting help from each other, I think is huge. If you've already lost someone, I think, um, you know, if you can find grief support groups, if you can get into counseling, I know it's, it's not cheap, but there are, I found a a free grief support group here in Austin. And that was, that was a lifesaver. That was a really good resource for me. Luckily I can kind of afford counseling (laughs) and that that's been helpful as well. But, um, yeah, lean on your friends and family and, you know, it's, you're not a burden. You know, that's what I think too many people are afraid of uh, being a burden. And I think, I know that's, my brother was like that too. He didn't, he didn't want to burden anybody. And um, yeah, it's just not good for anybody involved, really. Yeah, so he felt alone. I mean, obviously he didn't want to disappoint your parents, but he was trying to take care of it, the problem himself and... Yeah. yeah, many of us found that we can't do it by ourselves. We have to do it in community with others. So, absolutely. Um, other than the counseling group that you found was a lifesaver, anything else you found helpful to deal with your grief in your mourning? You know, I'm not a religious guy, I didn't, wasn't brought up going to church, but I found a group that teaches mindfulness. And it was created by a guy that had addiction issues and he had gotten sober. And became a Buddhist monk. Yeah, he started a mindful uh, recovery program. And he that was great because you could do it online. So you can just learn these tools, these skills. So yeah, explore your mind and your thoughts and how much that controls, you know, how you're experiencing life. So that was helpful. Well, to line things up towards the end of our interviews, we like to talk about some fun subjects. So is there any music that, I mean, what's on your uh, on your car radio when you're driving around there? Oh, man, everything. There's a really great public access or a public uh, radio station, KUTX, that it's a very eclectic mix of music. And that was one thing Matt and I had in common. We would always send each other different artists that we discovered or songs. And he was a musician. I was in choir throughout high school, so I can listen. If it's good music, I'll listen to it. Everything from <laughs> bluegrass to metal, rap, uh, <laughs> jazz. And do you have any travel plans in the next, uh, this year? Well, the year's almost coming to a wrap or next year, anything on your wish list? Um, I'd like to go, go back to Utah, see the parents and yeah, see some snow. The Texas summers have been pretty brutal. So it's nice to get out and (laughs) experience some cold every now and then. And there's no snowboarding in Texas? Nope. (laughs) (laughs) Not that I know. My state, we have snowboarding, but we don't have real mountains. So that's, I think, the place like Utah. That's that's where it's at, you know? Oh, man. Yeah, it's the best snow I've ever been in. Yeah. Well, I hope we honored the memory of your brother, Matt, today. And thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate everything you're doing to help folks struggling. And yeah, I think Matt would 
would be proud of this. Well, I hope you get to see your parents soon and take care. Thank you, Charlie. You too.